Thanks everybody for showing up. It's uh, my pleasure to give this course together with Alex Rodriguez, as Matteo was anticipating. And uh, so I will start today's lectures, uh, today's lecture with the following. I will first give you a couple of uh, more technical remarks, and then I will tell you something about the motivations that uh, drove us towards this direction. And you can see already from the title that this is a kind of a hybrid topic that connects two, in principle, distinct fields. Okay? I mean, from, from one side here, you have something data mining that if you wish, you can interpret as a specific form of unsupervised learning. So this is in general something that attains the field of data science. Machine learning, artificial intelligence. Okay. And from the other side, instead, you have something which is typically connected to a field of physics, the many body problem, that entails uh, several things. I mean, the, the, of course, the, the principal one is statistical mechanics, statistical physics, broadly speaking. But also entails related to that condensed matter and particle physics and so on and so forth. Yeah. Chemistry. So, why the hell are we trying to, to work at the interface between these two, in principle, disparate fields? Okay? And then one can have different sorts of motivation. Okay? The first motivation is that in the last maybe 20 to 30 years, in all of the fields from the right, uh, there has been an explosion in terms of new computational techniques and also larger computational power. Right? So this has generated, this has, uh, has changed in part the paradigm, or now we approach the many body problem by inputting this new ingredient, which is huge amount of data okay, that need to be interpreted. Okay? So this is really something that comes out of the last from the 1980s to today. Huge amount of data from computation. This is, of, of course, interesting for a theorist, but one should not forget that last, uh, in the last year, there has been also experimental developments. So we will not be dealing with that, but it's also true that to some extent, the update is also because experiments are also this huge amount of data. There is, however, uh, another motivation that I think uh, for you all that are interested in the, in the field of complex system is probably even even deeper and more fundamental, okay? is that when we think about the many body problems, specifically in the context of statistical physics, there is a one concept that we typically emphasize and we utilize to understand and conduct different phenomena. And this is the concept of universality. Universality is just telling us that very different fields, very different um, uh, instances of potentially also different problems share only very few things in common, one typical example of symmetry, and yet they behave in exactly the same manner. Okay? Then this can happen for when looking at the behavior of ultra cold atoms and molecules trapped into light, or the behavior of electrons in a solid, then you can think about or the, the one that fits most to your specific background. But this is something that really typically pertains to physics. And the idea is that what we really would like to see is whether this concept of universality can teach us something about data sets. Okay? Whether instead of having uh, an understanding of data set that is based on the tools that have been developed in the field of data science, we can have a, a different understanding that comes from, uh, from the direction of, of statistical physics. Huh? Of course, 
I mean, this is just one direction of the motivation. The other direction is to exploit this power, okay? this power the power of, of these new methods in the field of data science and, and supervised, unsupervised learning to learn something about statistical mechanics models, about many body problems that otherwise uh, it would be very hard to understand. Okay? Okay? So that, that, that is also the second direction. So that's, these are the two motivations and at the same time, the two goals okay, of, of this short uh, course, trying to uh, understand whether we can identify universality in data sets in the same way that we identify universality in physical phenomena, exactly the same way. And whether we can actually look at, power, at, um, at the data that are generated experiments or in computations, analyze them with new techniques that come from the field of unsupervised learning and understand something about these data structures and then about the physical phenomena. So how we will be doing this? Well, our approach, since we have two teachers, is really coming from two different sides. So in terms of methods, after an introduction, that will take place today. Uh, we will have to do it in, in two ways. I mean, the first way, I, we, I will review methods. I will come from this side and I will review methods to generate large, meaningful data structures related to physical problems. And in particular, in the physics of complex systems, I will uh, utilize classical statistical mechanics and I will discuss cluster algorithms. Okay? This will be tomorrow's. Uh, Friday, Friday talk. And I mean, you should really not see it as a as a super technical lecture. It will be mostly conceptual. What you really uh, have to, uh, um, what I would like you to appreciate from a methodological side is that as theorists, we have tools to generate large meaningful hello yes. sorry i want to ask a question uh yes let yes. me just finish writing this uh, this sentence eh? corresponding to physical phenomena Okay, I just wanted to to uh, write more clearly, just like um, what do you write in front of a cluster? This, uh, cluster algorithms. So is this that you okay. cannot read? Okay. Okay. Okay, good. okay, and then you can make your writing a little more bold so that um, it will be clearer enough. Thank you for pointing this out. So in right hand side of the blackboard, can you uh, write a bit large? Larger? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, right hand right. side, in right hand side of the book. Okay. Uh, these words are small, so uh, I'm unable to see them. Yes, no problem. Okay. So, tools to add large. data structures that correspond to physical phenomena. Thank you for these comments because after a year of writing all my lectures on a tablet, finally I'm in front of a real blackboard and I have to adjust back to size. So do not be scared of reminding me that I have to write larger during the course of the lecture. Okay? So this is really methodologically what the first part of the, of the course will be about. And then there will be a second part that will be developing the tools. Now that we have generated this data structure, we will have to analyze them. 
second part will be new tools to analyze. And then, once we have developed these tools, in the last lecture I will show you how to apply them to this physical phenomena and how to establish the links that we have targeted at the beginning, so observe universality in data sets and utilize unsupervised learning to, do, to do, learn something about the many body problem. Any question on this? Uh, there is questions here. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I don't think that for me. Very good. Okay. Typically, okay, let me maybe remind of a, of a thing. If you have physics question, it is much better to just unmute yourself and ask straight away. Okay, so uh, professor, uh, please. Professor, yes. Uh, do the uh, do the universality of data science is also characterized by some exponents that, as we see in the case for phase transition or population theory? Yes. The answer to your question is yes, but the reason why it is so, I will answer you in two weeks from now. Are you satisfied, or you want to be, want to have a primer? Uh, I think uh, two weeks later will uh, be enough for me. Okay, good. Then we will do it two weeks now. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Are there more questions? Okay, let me go ahead. So what we will do today, this is the lecture one. I will raise everything. So uh, since I know that you guys have a very uh, broad spectrum of backgrounds, I have decided to, to somehow uh, give a short introduction uh, to, to the models that we're interested in, the, the easy model that I'm sure every of you uh, has heard about, but I just want to uh, review some of its basic properties in this first lecture so that we set the language, but I will also use it to illustrate what I will tell you in the last lecture on a very, very minimal example. Okay. Before that, let me come back to the concept of universality okay, and the concept of phase transition. So what is a phase transition? Okay. Well, typically, uh, when we have a substance, uh, we have different phases at equilibrium, okay? and the substance can be everything. Okay? Let me just draw you uh, two examples. Okay. You can take uh, water. We you know that if we, in water we see a pressure, it will be a temperature. We have a phase diagram where here we have vapor. Here water. And here we have ice. So these are different phases of matter. And when you move from one phase to another, you cross what is called a phase boundary. Okay? These are called coexistence lines, and some of those end with what are called critical points. Otherwise, this will be something that we call just phase transition of first order. Let me give you the definition in a second. But before that, I want to show you that this is not just something that uh, it's uh, at the level of describing things that we can touch or so. I mean, one can also go more abstract and have exactly the same type of physical uh, pictures. Okay. Now, maybe this is something that every of you knows, but if I tell you what is the phase diagram, diagram of quantum chromodynamics, you could get scared and say, okay, what is going on here? This is a very strange particle physics. I don't know what they're talking about. But at the very end, what you really draw is always very simple phase diagram. In that case, temperature and with something which is called baryon density or chemical potential. And if you look at quantum chromodynamics, you will also see that there, there are lines, there are lines which are dotted, and there are phases. This is what is called quartz gluon plasma. Sorry, it's larger quark. Gluon 
Yeah, let's uh, find phase. Sorry, would you please write a bit larger? Yes. Thank you for reminding. And then there are other phases here in the rest of the field diagram. Just to tell you that, I mean, typical features, typical substances, at whatever scale they live, this can be particle physics or real world scenarios, they display phases and phase transitions. Okay? And phase transitions, transition between two phases, follow in several classes. Oh, okay, I wanted to stop now. For a minute, but let me say this. So, following in two major classes, again, okay, the first one are the so called first order transitions. Okay. And in first order transition, what you have is that typically there is coexistence along these lines, and these are indicated by discontinuities of first derivatives. Potentials for order parameters. Okay. And these are typically not related to universality. There is a sense of universality also in first order transition, but we will not be dealing with that. The transition we are interested in will be second order transitions. So these are transitions where one observes discontinuities in putting. Uh, thermodynamic potentials or order parameters, not at the first order, typically at second order or lower. In the past, there was a full classification depending on which order you observe something. Nowadays, it is most more commonly said that all the transitions which are continuous, they are second order. For the purpose of the examples that we will be discussing, second order and continuous are equivalent. And example of those, there are many, of course, and uh, one typical example is the two-dimensional easing model. And this would be the one that we will be discussing today. Okay? So just that uh, you remember one of the reference points in the course. Now, there are also transitions that do not immediately fall into this class, and maybe some of you have heard about the berezinski kosterlitz stalles transitions, so transitions where the, the nature of excitations that drives them is of topological nature. They typically do not display any discontinuity at finite order, so some, sometimes are referred to as uh, infinite order transitions. Uh, I will not be discussing BKTs, even though some of the things that I, I will be telling you about data sets can also be extended to these uh, topological transitions. Okay. Now, I would like to take a short break now, just to fight Zoom fatigue. Well, we can do something very short, like uh, two minutes. And of course, if you have questions, in the meanwhile, I will be happy to answer them. Uh, professor, uh, may I ask you a question now? Yeah, you can, sure. Uh, yes, uh, you said about infinite order transition. So uh, the second order transition is characterized by that uh, the first uh, order derivative of uh, free energy is continuous and the second order derivative is uh, discontinuous. And then the first order for first order is that is um, the first order derivative is discontinuous. But for infinite order is up to infinite order, every derivative is continuous? Correct, yes. Uh, and so, no, 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 in the sense that you will not find a discontinuity until you go down to infinite order. Uh, I can reply to your question with more detail, but it will take us the full amount of this lecture. If you are interested in, in a nice reference where some of these things are discussed in a way which I find accessible uh, 
There is a very nice book by Daniel Arobas. It's free, it's online. Book by Arobas. And I think it is a really, really beautiful uh, reference for statistical mechanics problem. And some of the things that uh, you have asked me are discussed there. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have uh, one more question. Is that anything uh, um, characteristics about correlation length in case of infinite order? The correlation length uh, does not follow power law or rather following uh, exponential divergence, something like that, that we see in case of BKT transition? Yes, yes. So the, the is it a characteristic length. property or this is on, only for BKT transition or is it is a characteristic for infinite order transition? Okay, to be honest with you, it's not that there are many infinite order transitions so that one, one can fully characterize them and into a class. I will tell you that this characteristic is, uh, I mean, my intuition would be that this exponential scaling with respect to reduced temperature, it's a common feature of all infinite order transitions because they are intrinsically non-perturbative. Okay, so I will tell you it's, it's generic. Of course, the specific form, like in BKT, that it comes with the square root of the of the reduced, uh, reduced temperature, this can change, but the fact that it's exponential should not be changed. Thank you. Cheers. So I see that in the chat, somebody asks, some reference textbooks could be helpful for this course. Of course. And I will send you everything. Okay? So what we are preparing with Alex is a, a text is actually a full tech file with all the text and all the figures and you will get it at the end of the course or maybe you will get a primer after the third lecture we have still have to see there is no really book about data and the many body from for obvious reasons but we can suggest you already from now uh, certain references that cover some of the topics that we discuss and in particular, at the end of today, I will put a few references on the elements, on the matrix channel, okay? So all of you that are on the matrix channel tonight will get the references. And for those of you that are not that yet there, please subscribe quickly. And if you don't know how to do it, please contact our secretary, okay? The secretary of the course. And then there is a question. So this course is about, is mainly about data mining with phase transition. Uh, yes. It will be mostly about data mining with phase transitions. One can, of course, also try to data mine uh, problems which are unrelated to transitions. Okay. For instance, phases of matter. This is a very interesting uh, topic. And uh, there are some known results in the field. But I, unfortunately, for reasons due to time, I will not be covering that. But if you are interested on that topic specifically, I will suggest that you repost this question on the matrix element tonight, on the matrix channel tonight, and I will send you references. Uh, yes, then if you're not on the matrix, you have to contact the secretaries and they will help you with that. Okay, I think our two minute pause went a bit longer. So I think that's okay. So, uh, so we have said that the last thing that we cover are that there are phase transitions of two different types. And we have mentioned that uh, what we want now, it's a, it's a model where we can review some of the features of these transitions. Okay? And the model is the two-dimensional easy model on the square lattice. So how is this model defined? I mean, most of you already know. Okay? One has to define lattice. What else will go 
square. And then one assigns variable, variables, sigma j, to each lattice. And these variables can only take two values, plus one or minus one. And our convention will be such that plus one we will indicate with a spin pointing up, and minus one we will indicate with a spin pointing down. Okay, so that's the configuration space of our of our model. And this model will be defined by a classical Hamiltonian or energy functional. Uh, and this energy functional will be very simple. We will be summing over all pairs of neighbors i and j. So this notation is all nearest neighbors. What we will have here, we will have j, sigma, sigma i, sigma j. Okay. And for the purpose of, of our uh, discussion, the sign of j does not matter. Uh, if j is positive, the energy would like to have neighboring spins which are anti aligned so that the total contribution is negative. Plus if J is negative, one would like instead to do the opposite, so to favor ferromagnetism, and this will be the choice that most of the time we'll be making. Even though our conclusion are not dependent, so it's ferromagnetic. Now, the easy model doesn't really have any parameter. So the only thing we can think of in terms of driving a transition in this model is temperature. Okay? So when we write down on this diagram of the easy model, there will always be something which is called which is temperature. Okay? And, uh, this would be zero. And we can, even by just looking at this Energy functional, we can easily guess. Let me see if there are questions. Okay. No. Uh, even if looking at looking at this energy functional, one can easily guess how this phase diagram uh, looks. If the temperature is uh, very small, so it's close to zero, temperature has to be measured in units of something. And for us, the unit will be J. Absolutely. Now, close to this regime, all the spins, because they would like to minimize this energy, would like to point into the same direction. Okay. So here we will have that pass what is called a ferromagnetic phase. Of course, nobody tells me that this will be the preferred choice. Of my spins, there will be a one, another one which will be equally probable, energetically speaking, will be all up down. This is a phenomenon which is called symmetry breaking. We will not be discussing that. We will just be interested into the fact that this phase is ordered. Okay? Oppositely, if the temperature overcomes the regime, in particular, when it overcomes J by a lot, at some point, we expect the spins not to care more about the energy because they will have a lot of temperature fluctuations, so they will have, will have no order. Uh, configurations like this will be equally probable, then configurations like this, so on and so forth. Okay? So this phase we typically refer to a paramagnet. Now, you all know that the two are separated by what is called second order phase transition at the critical value of the temperature, uh, Tc, units of J, 
And this can be computed analytically using, for instance, self duality of the easy model. And I forgot what the precise value was. I think it's two divided by the logarithm on one plus two. Uh, this is something like 2.26 something else. It does not really matter, okay? But okay, so these are the transitions we are interested in. So what characterizes this transition? Because so far, this is a qualitative uh, picture of, uh, of this problem. Okay? Now we would like to make it uh, on firmer grounds. Okay? So the first concept that is very useful for us to determine that is how we distinguish a ferromagnet from a paramagnet. Well, and the idea is that we can utilize what is called correlation function. Okay. So let me let me define it and then provide intuition. Okay. So we can say that, for instance, now we want to come, we want to describe the system by looking at the correlation between two spins at a distance r, and I define it for simplicity. Sigma j, sigma j plus r. And it does not really matter in which direction we are looking. Suppose that we are only looking in one direction and the system is isotropic. Now, how will this correlation function behave? Okay. Now, if we are in the ferromagnetic phase, all of the spins, or a very large majority of the spins, will be pointing to the into one direction. So there will be an infinite correlation between two spin at arbitrary distances. Okay? So this correlation, now plot it as a function of distance, and our ferro case is the white line. Well, this correlation will decay a bit at short distances, and but then we'll, we'll get to a constant. Okay? So when r is much larger than 1, this will go to constant. Let me write it more explicitly. C of R and this constant, for those of you that have already seen that, is nothing but is related to the order parameter. Okay? Now, instead, oppositely, if we are at very high temperature. In the paramagnetic phase, what will happen is that the C of R at very large distances, I mean, it will decay very fast because there is no correlation that's over. The spins are essentially independent variable. And what will happen is that this will decay with something that's called minus R divided by okay. So if we try to plot this. Here, we will see that this correlation decays very fast. Okay. And approaches zero within a length scale, which is related to this correlation. Okay. Now, what is interesting is what happens in the middle, okay? Exactly when we look at T equal to PC. Well, well, exactly at that point, what will happen is that if imagine that you approach it from the paramagnetic bias, the exponential will become slower, 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 slower. And at some point, it will have to transform some form to something that at some point approaches a constant. Yeah? And for second order transition, this, this happens like this. So C of R will be equal to 1 minus R to an exponent. And this exponent, let me write it precisely. For two dimensional easy model, this is exactly equal to eta. Okay. So if we, if we plot that at quantum critical, uh, the classical critical point of this model, this correlation does decay, but decays very slowly.
This connected to the question that by one of you a few minutes ago, this is one of the critical exponents, the eta critical exponent. Okay? So now all this change of, of behavior happens can also be described in a systematic manner that this comes from the normalization group and so on and so forth. But in particular, I, I just want to point you out one relation is that if we look at, uh, at the, how the correlation length approach the critical point, at the critical point, there is no, the correlation length will be infinite, okay? One, you can say that the correlation length is infinite at the critical point. Well, the way this infinity is approached is described by this equation that the correlation length will be proportional to T minus TC to minus nu. Okay? So the correlation length will approach infinity in a way which is not random. But for this second of the phase transition, it will be dictated by another critical exponent, the new critical exponent. And that will be universal. Okay? Now, these are just not uh, symbols. I mean, they also have true numbers, they can be computed analytically in the case of the 2D easy model. And in particular, eta is equal to one quarter and no is equal to one, 2D easy. And this, together with other critical exponents that we will not be touching, defines what is called a universality class. Now, very likely, most of you have heard this story already, different forms and different sources. But I think it's important to give you this reminder because first, I, I, I mean, this will be something that at the very end we will have to connect with data science. Okay? So this has to be better be there in ground. And also it reminds us that a very naive but physical approach to this problem, it's already allow allowing us to capture the, the basic features of what is going on, independent of this more refined understanding. So I think I will take a short break and read your questions now from the bottom. Uh, can we really define? Okay. There is apparently a discussion, so it's not really a question. So, if somebody has a question about this discussion, I will strongly suggest that the, the, he, um, he or she unmutes and ask the question. So the temperature is counted for inside the cup cream constant in special neutron. Uh, temperature is a microscopic parameter. Uh, temperature is an external parameter, okay? But for our purposes, I think you can understand it simply by the fact that temperature, it's an effective parameter that describes the fact that our system is not closed. I mean, this two easy model is not isolated in the full vacuum. It's in contact with an environment. And this environment, through a competition of energy scales, can be effectively described as a temperature. Okay. I think that would be the way I would define it. Are there other questions? Maybe I, I stop again for two minutes in case somebody has questions that want to be. Uh, I have a question. Please. Uh, as you say, you have three different form for the correlation function in the uh, para and zero and the critical point. Two. Yes. What is the uh, the rate of change from ferro to para for the correlation length. If I want to see it, you know, not with these three uh, equations, I want to see a, a one equation for all the 
temperature? This is an excellent question, and unfortunately, I'm not detaching this. So the idea is that this correlation length, this correlation function, it's a bit weird because it's constant, critical, and exponential. So if you want to do a full-fledged analysis in statistical mechanics, what you typically look at is not this function that I told you before, but a very close cousin, which is the connected correlation function. Okay? And the connected correlation function is this. This will be in the lecture notes, but I will not have time to get to this case. Is this minus the expectation value of sigma j, sigma j plus r. Now, at the critical point and in the paramagnetic phase, this correlation function behaves in the same manner as uh, the, the, the full correlation function. Okay? It's connected, huh? but because these expectation values will be essentially equal to zero, there will be no average preferred direction for the spins. But Inside the ferromagnetic phase, you can see that if this pin is up and this pin is up, not only this part is zero, but also this part is zero. Okay? So the connected two-point correlation function will behave in a different manner, will be critical at our critical point, but then it will decay exponentially to zero, both in the paramagnet both in the paramagnet and in the paramagnet. Okay. So this will allow us to define a correlation length that approaches the critical point from the paramagnetic side and a similar equation that approaches the critical point from the other side. And then you will not be surprised to get to know that this is also dictated by this. Well, in the very large majority of cases, it's dictated by the very same critical exponent. Not only this. Maybe for some of you, it's also interesting to note that here I put just proportional conditions. But one can make more rigorous studies and uh, especially for, for thermodynamic potentials, I study the coefficients of these expansions. Okay? These are called amplitudes. So the values of the amplitudes will not be the same, but the, but the, the ratios of the amplitude in some cases, approaching from left to right, will also be something that characterizes a universality class. So to answer your question, there is a lot to be learned also by looking at the transition from the other side, but this requires these connected correlation functions. And we will not be touching this. Thank you very much. Cheers. I was wondering if one, if we can also consider transition from linear photo as an example of a transition. Uh, unfortunately, for that specific phenomena that you are pointing out, um, so I uh, know this was a direct message, so I'll, let me repeat it for everybody. So a person is asking if, uh, if we can also consider transition from laminar flow to turbulence as an example of transition. I mean, in our context, we will only be dealing with equilibrium, so this we will not consider. Please, what does universality mean? Is universality applied to only, to the phase transition only? In our context, yes, it will be something that we, defined specifically for the transition only. However, from this formula that you have seen, you can already guess that universality also dictates not only how the system behaves exactly at the transition point, but also dictates how it behaves in the close vicinity of the transition. What close vicinity means is a non-universal aspect. May I ask another question? Uh, please, sure. Uh, Thinking about what you just explained, I, I wonder if uh, it means that we don't have the full two-point correlation function for the 3D easing model, right? No, 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 no. Uh, let us take, no, no, no. Forget about the 3D. Let 
let us focus on the 2D, the 3D, the very same reasoning will also work. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, now, so far we have been very naive, but I think it's important to, to tell you how we compute this correlation function, which is something we have not discussed. Okay? That, of course, all of you know, but it's like the elephant in the room that we have to introduce. I mean, and the elephant in the room is that whenever we, we talk about uh, classical statistical mechanics and equilibrium, there is one object, one quantity, which plays really the most important role, or uh, to, to the very least, a prominent role. And this quantity is the partition function. And the partition function is defined very simply. That is defined for the case of the easy model, but of course, I mean, you, you can define it similar for, other, for whatever model you are interested in. So it's, uh, it's decided by the sum over all the possible configurations of our spins. And I will assume that n, I will call n the number of spins in the system. And here we will have e to the minus beta, and here we will have h. Beta will be our inverse temperature measured in units of the Boltzmann way uh, of the Boltzmann constant. And here we will have the energy of the spin configuration. Sigma one, sigma two, sigma n. So that is the partition function, and the partition function has a huge power. Okay, so it allows us to compute thermodynamic potentials, gram potentials, and so on and so forth. Most importantly, this is the object that we typically utilize to compute thermal averages, expectation values. Okay, so if you are interested in some correlations of some object O, the way we define this correlation is by sum over all the possible configurations of this O e to the minus beta h divided by z, our partition function. Okay? So it is really a fundamental, fundamental object and, uh, and very powerful one. However, I don't know if you notice, but typically we never talk about Physical phenomena, phenomena might say, okay, the partition function is doing this or that. Okay? We typically think about observables because the partition function doesn't look like an observable. Okay? In fact, it's probably not. Okay? We typically are in correlations or energies or responses like specific heat. Okay? We don't look at the partition function uh, as an object. Okay. The course that we will be discussing about is, if you want, exactly the opposite perspective. We will not be interested about the details about what happens to correlations or to specific observables. We will just target this as an observable. Okay? In the same way you will, we will treat an observable, we will characterize the partition function. This is our goal. Now, uh, how are we doing with time? Hmm. Yes, I think I want to tell you something more. So how do we characterize a partition function? In general, this is very complicated. We can already see that this can be something which is related to a data structure. Because if you want, here, since the partition function is nothing but the sum over all the possible configuration, they very much look like a data structure, but there are also coefficients. Okay? So it's a bit strange. How do we deal with that? Okay? 
So I don't want to tell you the full theory, which is uh, relevant, uh, is relatively elementary, but it is long in terms of notation. So I would like to show you how we understand partition functions as data structures by taking an example of an easy model with three spins, which I think is the only example that I can break down, where I can break down everything. Okay? So now let us forget about our many body problem. We want to characterize a partition function of three spins. And we will not be able to do this fully today, but uh, I think it's a three spin easy model. Now, before doing that, let me tell you what does it mean that we want to characterize the partition function uh, in terms of, of what is called data structure. Okay. Well, the idea is the following. So we want to, whenever we talk about the data structure, we are typically uh, interested in, in two things. Okay, we want to define two things. So one thing is uh, an embedding space. Okay? And the other thing is the space of the features we are interested in. I think about when, when you do, try to do machine learning of images, okay? And for simplicity, let us think about black and white images, okay? An image, what it is? What is the data space, the embedding space of these images? It is nothing but the, the space of all the pixels of the image, and then in each of the pixels, you can either have a zero or a one. Zero stands for black, and one stands for white, I so on and so forth. You can choose also random, you can choose RGB, and then instead of having just a binary, you will have more and so on and so forth. But that's what you will call your embedding space. Now, within this embedding space, all the images that you collect, that can be faces of cats and dogs, they're very complicated. Okay? But they define a manifold within this huge space. And this manifold is the feature space we are interested in. So now, this is cats and dogs, the example I told you. We want to do the very same thing for partition functions. So we have to define, <coughs> sorry, we have to define our embedding space and our feature space. Now, the embedding space is relatively easy. Okay. So uh, first, our three side is in modern. What it is, we, we can down. This is our lattice model. This will be our spin one, sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. Okay. And how many configurations exist for for this model? So the configurations set. Well, it's very simple. There are just eight. Okay. You have the configuration where all the three spins are one. Then you can change the third spin to minus one, so on and so forth, till the configuration for all of them are minus one, okay? So eight states. Now, <clears throat> the, what we call embedding space is nothing but the space by defined, defined by these eight states. Defined by conf. Now, that's just a set expression. It is typically very nice to also have a geometrical and visual interpretation of this space, since these are just nothing but three variables with values plus plus and minus one, we can do it with a, with a cube. So let me use a different notation, otherwise it can be confusing. This is not the easy model. This is our configuration space that we are drawing in a cube. And what is the criterion for drawing it as a cube? Well, 
Well, the idea is that we can say that uh, the bottom left element in our cube is the state one, one, one. Now, if we, if we move into the x direction, we, we say that this is the state which has minus one, one, one. I think you are understanding how it's going. Now, if we move into this direction, we will change the second. Minus one, minus one, one. And in this state here, it will be minus one, minus one. Minus one. <laughs> so the embedding space of our partition function, I will abuse notation, so be very careful. It's nothing but Z2, the group of two elements. Or you can see it as a cube. Now, of course, uh, I have designed this example with three spins, but you can imagine how, because already if I have four spins, I don't know how to write the, the embedding space of a four spin easy model on a blackboard. I will need another direction. You can imagine how difficult that is to get, to get a simple graphical interpretation about what is going on for a full-fledged many-body problem. Okay? We just don't know how to visualize it. And this is exactly why we will need these unsupervised learning techniques to characterize it, because it is something that evades phys simple physical understanding. Okay. Now, now we have to define a feature manifold here. Okay, our cats and dogs. So how can we see cats and dogs in this uh, within this embedding space? This is a bit more complicated and. Uh, it is, I think, a good point to pause and to stop this lecture and take questions if there are. So feel free to ask. I think. Uh, yes, I had a, a technical question. Uh, Please. Because uh, not everyone has access to matrix rooms for now. So mm -hmm. some uh, information, can you also put it on the website, please? Uh, yes, if you wish. Uh, uh, so like the lecture notes, for instance. Yes. Because... Yes, the lecture notes I will also put on the website, but I will put them at the end of the course. Okay. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Excuse me, can I ask a question? Uh, so, uh, are the SPNs assumed to be localized in this system? I mean, there is an, uh, no degenerate states. I mean, any states are important in this system. Uh, yes, the spins, are local, the spins are localized. We will not be dealing with itinerant uh, spins. To be frank, I think it is possible to extend some of the things that I will be telling you to itinerant systems, which are also very relevant. Uh, but I will not have time to discuss this. Okay, thank you. Please. Professor, I have a question. Please. Um, could you elaborate on your comment on unsupervised learning and how it comes into play? Yes, uh, I can come. Well, uh, Alex will discuss this connection. I mean, the method that we will be using, they can be construed as forms of unsupervised learning in the sense that we will characterize features of data sets without labeling, without anything, without training anything. We will just be looking at them. If you know something about unsupervised learning, the most naive of the methods, the most simple not naive, of the methods that fall into the class of the things that we, will be, we are using is a principal component analysis. If this says something to you, I'm not so sure. Thank you. Cheers. Professor, uh, yes. we can uh, we can calculate so many things from partition function, but but can we say it uh, does it have any physical meaning or not? It's a very good question that you're asking. It is not guaranteed. The fact that the, the, the stuff that we are doing here and what we will show you tomorrow, it is not guaranteed to tell you anything about uh, uh, anything which has physical meaning. 
It will be only at the very end of the last lecture that I will show you how this is actually related to response functions that we do know have physical meaning. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, could you please repeat what you meant by characterizing the partition function? Uh, look, let me repeat it tomorrow because what I will do tomorrow, I will start, uh, not, not tomorrow, on Friday, I will uh, start the beginning of the lecture with a brief wrap up of what I told you in the last 10 minutes because I will need this definition again of this blackboard. Okay, so I will, I will repl uh, reply to you more extensively directly at the beginning of the next lecture. Uh, sorry, if I may ask uh, one a short question. So in the embedding space, uh, is that, uh, uh, so we have eight states, uh, is it that all of them uh, would be stable? For example, if you want to encode uh, just cats and dogs, so you have two uh, features. So um, you don't need eight of them. And- uh, okay. okay, 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 good. I mean, this question is so on spot that I can reply to you. So suppose that we are sampling only a ferromagnetic phase. It will be very clear that we will need only two of these points, which are really important. Yeah, exactly. Right? Okay. So this implies that on this data space that we are looking at, I mean, we don't really need the full cube. We just need a line. Okay. Instead, if we are at very high temperature, we will need all the eight states to characterize our set. Okay. So there is a fundamental change in the data structure that is needed to characterize different phases, very much akin to the fact that the more complex images you are trying to classify, like cats and dogs, but then maybe also subspecies or colors of the dogs and so on and so forth, then you need more information. So we will see, I mean, some of the things we will be, I will be telling you on Friday can be seen as a transition in the amount of information that is required to faithfully describe the state. Okay, I see. I think I have to give you a short break before next lecture. Matteo, what do you think? I don't want to... Yes, yes. I think uh, maybe we'll uh, take a short break. Uh, we will resume uh, at uh, quarter past uh, three uh, Central European time with the first lecture of, uh, by Domenica Boetti. And uh, we'll continue with uh, Marcello on Friday, right? Yes. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye. So I'll assign you to breakout rooms so that uh, maybe you want to chat or maybe you want just to disconnect. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll uh, join together uh, in uh, less than 10 minutes.
Ciao Domenica. Ciao Matteo. Tutto pronto, ho sentito un po' quando hai introdotto e poi sono stata tutta zitta dietro le quinte. Come eh. sta andando? No, speri, speri che... Molto sì. bene, abbiamo sempre circa 150 partecipanti, e quindi senti vuoi provare a... Sì esatto, a fare lo share, devo fare la share di due cose, questo che è la main, allora intanto mi metto in pre presentazione, la vedi tutta in... Sì. C'è un sacco di, di, di video, c'è cioè, dei video. Dei ah, allora, se c'hai dei video, uh, sai che devi... Oh, sì, sì, non dei video, scusami, c'ho dei, dei... Allora, questo, questo è un suono. Ah. Poi altre cose così. Un video, aspetta che vado ai video. Ta, 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 ta. Quando, quando fai condividi su Zoom, ci sono dei bottoncini da schiazzare per ottimizzare Zoom ah. per i video. Ok, questo è un, è, un, è un video molto breve. Però non si vede. Aspetta. aspetta eh. Io vedo soltanto, ah, ho visto soltanto un pallino blu a un certo punto. Sì, sì, deve flickerare, è una roba breve, è un esperimento, <ride> è un esperimento, capito? Sì, sì, non è una roba di alta risoluzione. Ci sono dei pallini, però, cioè, mi stai dicendo che c'è un modo per ottimizzare more? Sì, quando fai, esce un po'? Optimize for video clip, I saw it. Sì. È questo. Però tanto il video è molto breve, eh? non è una sì, roba... Sì, 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 ma... È una... Esatto, e poi c'è un'altra cosa. Adesso faccio... Eh, se voglio fare lo sharing di un'altra cosa che mi sembrava molto carina da presentare, allora stop share e faccio lo share di un'altra cosa. Questo solo oggi, però voglio switchare a questo, che è una navigazione... Aspetta... Aspetta, scusa, sto in zoom mi chiede. Ok. Questo lo vedi? Vedi il cervello? Sì. sì. Eh, e questo praticamente se io muovo, cioè navigo sostanzialmente. Ah, ok, interessante. Questo è molto carino perché prima faccio vedere una versione schematica dell'occhio, del chiasma uh -huh. e poi vedere in the brain. Questa sono io, oh, sì. eh. Eh, ce l'ho pure io, queste, queste sono risonanze magnetiche, no? Immagino. Sì, sì, questa è una strutturale, sì, un'immagine statica, una morfologica del soggetto. Uh -huh. È molto carino perché così faccio vedere più o meno una cosa introduttiva, così, insomma, quando parlo di aree visive, più o meno che sappiano. Poi è un po' interessante vedere un po' dove sì, sì, sì. dallo schema alla realtà. E poi si sì, ritornerò in realtà al alla... Main, uh, quando finisco la lecture uh, ti, ti mando il, devo, perché ho visto che 